all children aged five and over. England and Northern Ireland have agreed to accept advice from experts following the change in policy by Wales and Scotland. This has been the reaction from mums in Macclesfield. I want more research, I want more evidence that it is it's a necessity for them. I think it should be fair that the parents should decide whether they have it or not and make it optional. Britain is deploying more troops to Eastern Europe along with warships and typhoon jets to the Mediterranean. It's as tensions remain high on the Ukrainian border. NATO defence ministers are increasing their readiness for a potential Russian invasion. Rail passengers travelling between London, York and Leeds are being told to rethink journeys this Friday due to Storm Eunice. LNER says passengers can also get a refund following a weather warning of strong winds. Some rail services in Scotland have been suspended this afternoon due to the effects of Storm Dudley in northern areas. A 70-year-old man has been jailed for three and a half years and banned from contacting Lord Alan Sugar. Patrick Gomes was found guilty of sending the Apprentice Star anti-Semitic letters. To the city, the FTSE 100 closed down five points at 76.03. The pound buys $1.35 and €1.19. LBC weather very windy tonight. Heavy rain clearing to leave blustery showers, particularly across the north. Severe to storm force gales for Scotland with heavy rain due to Storm Dudley, a yellow warning for wind and now snow is in place for parts of Scotland, lows of two. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Zora Suleiman. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross-question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It's two minutes past eight on LBC. Welcome to the programme. I'm Ian Dale. On our cross-question panel tonight, we have Norman Baker, former Liberal Democrat Transport Minister in the Coalition. He's also, and this is quite apposite for our discussion this evening, author of And What Do You Do? Can't think who that could be about. And What the Royal Family Don't Want You to Know. Eleanor Mills is founder of Noon, an online media platform and community for middle-aged women. She's far too young to do that sort of thing. And former editorial director Director of the Sunday Times. We'll find out more about Noon in just a moment. Ibrahim Dogus is a businessman, Labour councillor and founder of the Centre for Turkey Studies, the country, not the, not the bird, and Centre for Kurdish Progress, as well as the Westminster Institution, wait for it, the British Kebab Awards. <laughs> find out more about that later as well. Patrick Mercer has never had a kebab in his life, I'm sure. He's former colonel in the British Army, former Conservative MP and Shadow Minister. Right, we are are going to crack on with your questions if you want to ask our panel a question 0345 606 and you can watch us on global player call 0345 606 tweet at lbc text 84850 cross question with ian dale this is lbc right let's go to alex in pimlico alex hi what would you like to ask Oh, hi, Pano. Uh, my question is, if Prince Andrew is innocent, why he paid 12 million quid? And where did this money come from? Well, Norman Baker, we, we don't know that it's £12 million. Pounds. That's what's being speculated on. But um, if, he, if he is innocent, why has he agreed to pay this? And where will the money come from? It seems pretty certain it's uh, over 10 million from the reports that have been circulated. Where is it coming from? Well, it's not coming from his own resources, I don't think, because uh, Fergus is spending money like water, as she always does, and uh, the uh, unpleasant characters in the Middle East who've been funding him for recent years have uh, probably lost interest in him because he's lost his value. So it's probably going to come from the, the Queen, largely. That's the reality of it. Um, that's a lot of money to, to find for someone that he says he never met. Well, in indeed, but so if he's got to pay £12 million and the Queen's got to come up with it, where does she get... I mean, she's obviously very rich. Yes. In, in, uh, but where does that money come from? Because people will say, well, we pay money out of our taxes to the royal family every year. It's surely not going to come out of that. Uh, well, it may well do indirectly or directly. And First of all, you have to realise that the Queen receives... For the sovereign grant, an enormous amount of money every year. It's 83, 84 million for the last year, which is way in excess of other monarchies in Europe. If you go back to 9, 2011, just 11 years ago, the civil list was 7.9 million. So there's been a huge increase in that period Why? of time. Uh, the settlement from George Osborne linked the royal finances to the Crown Estates, which um, is, in my view, quite improper. Um, and since that time, of course, the Crown Estates done very well. The Queen's getting a, a massive bonanza for all these wind farms she put onto uh, on the seabed. Which 
which all comes back, a quarter of that money comes back to her. She also gets money every year from the Duchy of Lancaster, which is a sort of, uh, without being rude, a sort of royal slush fund, which operates and gives her uh, a regular income of several million a year. Uh, for example, people who die in the, in the Duchy of Lancaster without a will, the money goes to the Duchy of Lancaster. So there's a huge amount of money from that. And then you have to look at the, the other sources of money. She gets, for example, Buckingham Palace, we are spending... £359 million pounds in refurbishing it, uh, but the ticket sales uh, for the trips around uh, the Buckingham Palace, she's taking the money for that. Several million When, when pounds you say she's taking the she money, is, I mean, it's not going into a private bank account, presumably. Well, we don't know. It's certainly going to be used by her. It's, it's regarded as her money is the answer when you ask the question. So there's numerous sources of income, and if you look back over the last, over her reign, for the first part of her reign at least, she was exempt from a large number of taxes. She paid no income tax until 1993 for 40 years. She paid no uh, dividend in investment tax for 40 years. And the Daily Mail, I think it was, reckoned that that alone, that particular instance, had netted her almost a billion pounds. So, you know, the exemption from taxation, as well as everything else, have meant she's extremely well off. So she can well afford £12 million to bill Andrew out. So, in effect, you're saying that the £12 million, we will have paid for it somehow? I think so, and it's even the worst scenario because it's possible that if the Dutch, if she used the Duchy of Lancaster money, um, my understanding is uh, she will put that off as a, a legitimate expense and offset it against tax. So we will actually pay that way because her income tax bill will be reduced. Um, Patrick Mercer, if Norman is right, that sounds completely outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> it is very hard to defend if Norman is right. Um, yeah, I, I, I've been watching this with some interest, uh, I must say. <clears throat> I'm not, not completely, my mind was not, was not completely made up about all of this, particularly the point that's already been made when it now appears that um, uh, the young lady in question, uh, who Matt, Prince Andrew says he's never met, he's now made a financial settlement on. But the thing that's... Not just a financial settlement, 12 million. I mean, I was, yeah, I, sure. I was expecting it to be one or two million. <laughs> well, a couple of hundred, was it? Well, I mean, <laughs> one or two million, you could think, well, he could probably find that down the back of the sofa somewhere, but 12 million... But what, yeah, okay, I mean, fine, it's a financial settlement, we don't quite know what it is. What did surprise me slightly was the fact that before the thing was cut and dried, before Andrew either came forward and said tacitly, yes, I am I am guilty of this, or yes, I'm ready to make a settlement, I appreciate he hasn't apologised, that the royal family started stripping him of, um, mm. of his duties and his various appointments and the various honorary ranks that he held. Um, I was under the impression that you were innocent until proved guilty. Well, it's quite difficult in the American legal system, uh, isn't it? Because, in, in essence, most people are advised to plead guilty even when they're not because sure. of the jail sentence. Now, obviously, this is different because it's a civil case, not a criminal case. But um, I, I suspect his legal advice would have been, well, OK, you could take this to court, but bear in mind it'll be a New York jury. They're inevitably going to be just psychologically biased towards her because she's American. I mean, yeah. I don't know whether that would be the case or not, but you can uh, you can understand the reasons for that. Um, but, on the other hand, I mean, his reputation is now gone. Yeah, yeah entirely, and I, I'm being naive if I'm not suggesting I don't think that there's been a very difficult and very uh, tortured conversation inside the family where quite clearly... They knew what was coming. Of course they did. And they knew that there was going to be further embarrassment, which could perhaps be mitigated, which I think it probably has. I still come back to it that, I, I, you know, I was... I was one, I, I hardly know Prince Andrew, and I was... If I say I'm sympathetic, that's not the right phrase. You but have I, met him. Uh, yeah, but I can understand the sort of difficulties that he's in, and then suddenly all of this happens before the verdict has been passed. Uh, water under the bridge now. I've never met anyone who's had a good word to say about Prince Andrew. I've never met him. Have you got anything good to say about him? Uh, he's extremely smartly dressed. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor. Um, I have met him because we interviewed him for the Sunday Times magazine when I was the editor, and I went to Buckingham Palace and we were shooting him for the cover, supposedly. Well, I was going to say that. a normal shooting weekend, was it? <laughs> Different shooting weekend. And Little he, was, he behaved like a spoilt child. Yeah. He um, he was really petulant. We did a few shots and, and we'd agreed that we'd do a shoot in the hall and he just suddenly decided at the last minute he wasn't going to do it. And the journalist had been all over the world following him around doing his pitch at Palace and it was a stupid decision of his because he'd, that he and his team had invested so much time and effort in doing these things. There'd been endless meetings with 
really peculiar courtiers in a really unglamorous bit of Buckingham Palace, like a funny kind of, um, like a gable kind of up at the top where Andrew's rooms were with his kind mm. of equerry. It was really strange, the whole thing. And then he messed it up right at the last minute, so we didn't put him on the cover. And But I actually saw him being petulant, not listening to advice, thinking that he knew best, and being completely arrogant. And I have to say, as a woman, I find him absolutely revolting. And I also think that he has been hiding in plain sight. He was called Randy Andrew for years. Everyone knew what he was up to. He was Randy Andy on the Lolita Express. What did people think was mm. happening? And so the idea that he's, you know, if Prince Andrew's innocent, why does he pay 12 million? Where's the money come from? Is the question I asked. Well, I don't think he is. I don't think he does look particularly innocent. And the, the royal family have paid the money to stop, well, to try and stop this overtaking the whole of the Queen's special jubilee year, mm. I, I think. And, and I think it's I feel very sorry for the Queen, but I think he now has to completely disappear from the public stage. And this idea that he's going to be a great champion of sex trafficked women. I mean, I love the, the lawyer on the telly last night who was going, well, I don't think any of the women are going to want him anywhere near them, thanks, but they'll take the money. Well, I suggested that he should retire to the middle of Dartmoor with Fergie and live just a private <laughs> life. But then I got hassle from people who live in Dartmoor saying, so <laughs> we don't want him either, thank you very much. I think he should be covering the General um, of South Georgia, is my view. <laughs> oh, send him back to Switzerland. Ibrahim. <laughs> What's your view? I mean, I have not met Andrew, Prince Andrew, nor any of his friends, especially the American ones. And uh, <laughs> I would say, I mean, the, the details of the settlement is not yet clear. Uh, but, um, you know, the sum of money involved makes you think that people with wealth and power can get away uh, with, um, from, you know, can escape from accountability, which is quite worrying. I mean, if you, and the key concern for us all is the victims of sex trafficking, uh, in this case uh, in America, but uh, many others across the world uh, in the UK. I mean, uh, we need to make sure that uh, the public but does pay attention to just, this. Just on that, though, we have to remember this was a civil case, not a criminal case. And if it had been a criminal case, um, however much money he had, I don't it think that would have got him off. Um, here, if this had been an ordinary member of the public that was accused of these things, the case would have never been brought anyway. It's purely because he was a member of the, or is a member of the royal family yeah. that, that the case has been brought. So I, I, I understand what you mean about, well, money can buy a lot of things, but he wouldn't have been in that situation had he not been Prince Andrew. Yeah, I mean, if he, you're right. Um, but I think what we need to be paying attention to is if the money is going to be, 12, 10 to 12 million pounds is going to be spent on the settlement case, we just need to make sure that it's not um, taxpayers' money, it's family's money. And the family, um, alongside the sovereign grant that Norman mentioned, they will have, they do have some other income from the properties they own and so on. So any every penny uh, for the settlement should come from their own funds rather than taxpayers' but, funds. But Norman, would the Queen have a literally a private bank account which was nothing to do with the activities and income from the royal family? Well, it depends how much she inherited, uh, obviously, when she came to the throne. But, of course, she got private bank accounts. She got private bank, bank accounts at Cooch. She got lots of overseas investments in uh, offshore uh, islands. We saw that from the Guardian papers that were produced. So she's not short of a bob or two. Um, Alex, what do you think? You asked the question. Yeah, I did ask the question, but honestly, I didn't really get the quite answer because my question was, if he's really innocent... Why he must pay 12 million quid? It simply don't make a sense. Absolutely. He Ele knew Eleanor will explain it to you. Eleanor will explain. The reason why he's paid £12 million is because the palace are looking at this and going, this is a disaster for the Queen's special year and it's worth £12 million to the royal family to shut this down and not to have an absolute media circus around his um, deposition, the, the American lawyers asking questions about his sex life, his sweating, what he did with this girl. I mean, from a media point of view, it would have been an absolute frenzy and the palace were desperate to shut that down. Can you imagine the Queen on parade, trooping the colour, it's all, all the pageantry, and in the background there's all this revolting stuff about Andrew and whether or not he slept with this girl. They had to stop it. So just in terms of the media strategy, um, the reputational risk, the royal family, they had to shut it down. That's why they paid the £12 million. So they've thrown him under the bus, really. Alex, thank you very much indeed for your question. We're going to take another question on the a related subject to this in just a moment. There's lots of other things you could ask about tonight too. 0345 6060 973. It's quarter past eight. This is LBC. The highway
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 18 minutes past eight. Let me remind you of our panel, if you've just tuned in. Patrick Mercer, former Conservative MP, Ibrahim Dogas, businessman, Labour councillor and founder of the British Kebab Awards. Norman Baker, former Transport Minister and author of What the Royal Family Don't Want You to Know. And Eleanor Mills, founder of Noon. Just explain what Noon is. It's a new platform for women in midlife, which is trying to address the fact... And what, what do you count as midlife? Uh, well, we think kind of 45 upwards. Right. Okay. Um, and it's looking at um, gendered ageism, which is where sexism meets ageism. And the later parts of women's lives are massively undervalued. I think, in our society. And I want all women to look forward to being 50 as a time when they get to do all the things that they want to do. It's an age of opportunity. Not to dread it, which is what the current narrative is about. And there's also a whole new generation, a whole new load of women becoming 50 who have worked all the way through in a very different kind of mentality. So I'm trying to break through those barriers and change the narrative. Is it an app? Is it a women. website? It is a website and it's we've got lots of social media stuff and we're a campaigning thing. We ran we run lots of articles and we try and be as noisy as possible. So you're a, a sort of older mum's net. Oh. oh, sorry. I said the wrong thing. Oh, no, right. As soon as I said it, I thought you were an idiot. No, it's, well, it's not that, because actually what's really interesting about these women is nearly a third of university-educated Gen Xers don't have children women. A third? Yeah. Really? A third of the really educated ones. So it's absolutely not mum's net. Because okay. there's a lot of people who have chosen not to Had have to children. to make that clear. No, it's one of the, it, actually that's one of the really kind of interesting like hot button topics. And it. so the website name? It's called noon.org.uk. That must have cost you a lot of money to get that website name. Not really, actually. Yeah, well, well done you. <laughs> right, um, let's go to our next uh, question. It's a text from Jean in Earls Barton, Northamptonshire. Uh, shouldn't we just scrap the monarchy now, or at least after the Queen dies? Ibrahim. I think the monarchy is, uh, I mean, royal family um, and the monarchy is part of the foundation of British identity and culture. I think the Queen in particular is doing a great job in representing Britain, uh, the brand Great Britain in a way across the world. That brings a lot of investment in what, into UK, I think, financially. So it benefits the country and people, all the citizens within the country. So we do have um, a responsibility towards funding that operation, funding the way uh, royal family represents Britain and uh, provides, uh, you know, the, the support they, they are providing to the country but uh, maybe it's time to reconsider some of the aspects of the work royal family does whether I mean with, with, the, with the sacrifices Queen has made uh, with the work she has done people are quite fond of that but when it comes to uh, other members of the royal family people do have a lot of skepticism and, uh, and um, complaints or criticism to make I think Patrick Absolutely not, no. Um, the, the royal family, I completely echo what Ibrahim is saying, royal family are part of the fabric of this country and they're one of the great institutions and, <laughs> fingers crossed, so far have continued to represent the country extremely well. I think the Queen is irreproachable in what she has done. I think the Duke of Edinburgh was, a, again, a huge institution, someone who was widely admired. I, I tremble slightly when I see and hear the sort of things that we have been talking about just a few moments ago. I also wonder and regret some of the political comments that are being made by members, younger members of the royal family. Now, if we can stand up beyond that, if the, the next generation that are coming through can understand the example that has been set, not just by the current Queen, but also by her father and her predecessors, then I think they're an extremely important institution. But... They've got to adapt. I mean, you know, I come from Newark. Charles I, he had to adapt. They cut his head off in the process. And I'm not suggesting we do that. But, of course, they've got to adapt. They cannot be sticks in the mud. But I'm 100% behind them. Hello. I love the Queen. I think the I think the I mean I'm I'm a champion of the older lady and the Queen is definitely like noon icon number 1. So um we I love the I totally love the Queen, but I really worry that the next generation don't understand the distinction between kind of duty and monarchy and celebrity. Um, and we've certainly seen that with with Harry mm -hmm. and Meghan. Mm -hmm. And I just don't I don't think now anyone would probably do what the Queen has done, which has spent her whole life doing what she was supposed to do, not speaking out in public, or never putting a foot wrong, getting
setting up, I'm sure, when she felt absolutely dreadful and would rather stay in bed and go and go and open some supermarket somewhere. Years and 75 years of it. And I just can't see the next generation doing that. And I think that Prince Charles now is, is kind of so old. I mean, everyone else who's Prince Charles's age is is really retiring so to have spent your whole life waiting to do a job and then basically be so old when you get to do it you're kind of joe biden that's not brilliant well it's a bit like edward the seventh isn't it i mean he was quite old when he got to be king and he was only king for 10 years but um uh, i mean he was he was i think considered quite a good king and he did he did adapt to the role of duty i mean when he was Ed, when he was prince of wales he was very much a playboy Having said that, he still was when he was king. I, think, <laughs> I, don't think <laughs> I was going to say, I don't, think he's, I don't think he's a great example. Um, but I don't, I, I don't think that Prince Charles has the same level of respect or of judgment that the Queen has shown over such a long period. And I also, I know that the Queen's now said that Camilla should be um, Queen Consort, but I, I still, every time I, I think back to all those tabloid headlines and, you know, um, Prince Charles wanting to be Camilla's Tampax, let's not forget. I was praying it wouldn't go there. I know, but I mean, I think we we <laughs> kind of have to go there. How can you possibly have a monarch who is on the record saying that? I mean, maybe that's all like, well, we're all like down with the kids now, but I don't think so. <laughs> I think that the, the mystery of monarchy, for me, evaporated in that, you know, all those squidgy gate tapes. <laughs> yeah. I think the mystery of Camilla's tamp actually made a mystery. Um, Norman. Sorry, I can see you all. That's the only woman on this panel. I can just see you all looking absolutely Norman. horrified. <laughs> I wasn't on, going to go quick. to the tamp land. <laughs> but um, no, no, the tree that doesn't bend will break, is a sort of old-fashioned saying. And the fact of the matter is that uh, the monarchy is hasn't changed very much for a very, very long time, and it now needs to change if it's going to survive. This is, this is not my personal opinion, it's an objective view. Uh, Charles said he wants to modernise it. He needs to modernise it because, you know, the front cover of my book, which you kindly, kindly mentioned, Ian, uh, there are four... It's, it's price. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, nine, I think it's 10 99 um, And there's got 44 of them on the balcony. I mean, who are these people? Why are we paying for these people who are all standing on the balcony? You know, we need... We well, need we're to not, monitor. are we? We're not paying well, for we are 44. Paying, we are paying for a lot of them they're all paying we're paying security for a lot of them who you've never heard of princess alice and people were paying security for and there's 44 of them but anyway look the fact of the matter is that we need to have a monarchy in my view if we're gonna have a monarchy like they do in the benelux countries or in scandinavia where you have the the monarch the monarch's children and the monarch's grandchildren that's it and the rest of them go out there and living and and save I think we could all buy into that couldn't we yep no difficulty with that. Yep, that's called cool, and, and that's what's going to have to happen, I think. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we have got a situation where uh, we have got too many hangers on. That's what people say. I think the average person in the street, if I get it right, wants a monarchy, likes the Queen, but doesn't want all the rest, the periphery, the tax breaks and everything else that goes with it. They want those to stop. It's interesting, though, that the monarchy has survived in the way that it has, because it has been incredibly resilient and it has modernised from time to well, time. Well, not very if you, much. Well, if you look at Prince Philip, I mean, I think he was the arch moderniser of his generation. And I think since the death of Diana, they have modernised. You may think not enough. I don't think, I don't think they've really modernised very much, unless you include um, having open affairs and marrying someone when you're when you're having an affair with somebody else. I suppose that's modern in a way. Not sure but, it is, um, is it, really? Oh, well, it's, it's been it's, pledged it's, of that in the past. And the <laughs> well, it's now public. Uh, in a way Always was. <laughs> well, anyway. So, yep. yeah, I think they've got to go further than they've gone. There's no question about that. And and uh, we need to have the monarchy on a, on a different basis to the one we've had. And there's no indication yet that that's happening. The other thing is that there's tremendous respect for the Queen. Nobody says that. And I don't think anyone disputes that. And I think the Queen has done a, a very good job over her reign for the reasons that Eleanor said. But the fact of the matter is, with the hereditary principle, you don't get to choose who's next. It's next in line, whoever they are. And Charles has not got the same respect as the Queen. He Not least of all because of Diane and everything else, but also all these spider letters interfering in government business, which he shouldn't have been doing as a Prince of Wales. Did uh, you ever get one? No, he wouldn't dare send one to me, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you I know, just love like to have read the reply. Also, the post it. He shouldn't have been doing that, and 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 you know he's pushed for more money for the royal family when they've got plenty of money. He's not in the right position. And now, of course, today, I don't know if coming on to this again, he's as a result of my letter, I might say, he's now being he's pulled into this investigation by the Metropolitan Police about. Oh, this is about, all down to you. I, I made a complaint in September. Did yes, you? They've now replied to me saying they're investigating it. Such a stirrer. 
<laughs> Let, let's bring in something that somebody has texted in about. It says, Ian, the headline in the Times this evening, Prince Andrew adamant that he will attend his father's memorial service. A service of thanksgiving for the life of his father will take place on March the 29th at Westminster Abbey. The full details have not yet been announced, but the media will be given the opportunity to cover the event. Now, do, do any of you think he shouldn't attend that? I think he should be allowed to go to his father's memorial service. Of course he should. I mean, he's still, it's still his dad. Yes, exactly. I'd be interested maybe... to know what uniform he's wearing. No yes. uniform. Well, he's still entitled to wear his yes, uniform. Yeah, well, Absolutely. Uh, I'm not... what, would the, what, would his, what would various regiments think about that? Oh, I think actually, I mean, I, I think there's regiments in the navy. I think there's been a lot of uh, a lot of sort no, of. No, but um, the army, in the uh, military. I don't detect in the, the serving officers and soldiers to whom I speak. I don't detect that there is really very much reservation about not not about the man, but about the appointment. Um, and I think a lot of that has been very high-handed. What would the army and the, the navy make of it? I think probably they would recognise that it's time time to sever the link. And therefore, I can't. Is he still a vice admiral, isn't he? Um, he is a vice admiral. Yes, yeah, he didn't become admiral. He was going to become admiral when he was sixty, and that was knocked on the head. But he's a vice admiral. So he. Um, well, so the navy would would be happy with him wearing all the regalia. Well, I, I, technically, he would be allowed to wear it. It'll, that was my point, really. Will he actually wear his uniform? I, sus mm. I suspect not. Well, we'll find out on March the 29th, it, 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 it seems. Can't wait. <laughs> Indeed, right. Lots more questions coming in. 0345 6060 973. It's coming up to 8.30. Let's get the news headlines on LBC with Sora Suleiman. All children aged 5 to 11 will be offered a COVID vaccine in the UK. England and Northern Ireland have followed a decision made by Scotland and Wales to extend their vaccine rollouts. NATO Secretary General says there's no sign of de-escalation by Russian forces on the ground near Ukraine. Jens Stoltenberg said Russia still had a huge force ready to attack. LBC weather very windy tonight with rain clearing to leave blustery showers, particularly across the north, a low of two degrees. LBC. Turn.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.32 is the time. 0345 6060 973 if you'd like to ask our panel a question. We have Norman Baker with us, Eleanor Mills, Ibrahim Dogas and Patrick Mercer. Um, a text from David in Made of Vale says, Why is the West ignoring a simple notion that Russia has a right to push back? Eleanor. Well... That, that look was saying, why did you come to me first? <laughs> <laughs> why is the West ignoring a simple notion that Russia has a right to push back? Well... It doesn't really look like Russia is pushing back because they've got what, over 100,000 troops sitting along the border of the Ukraine. And I know the idea is that Russia's put the troops there because they're worried about NATO expansion and that Ukraine is going to become, um, might become a, a member of NATO and that they feel that that would really kind of threaten their, their territory. But I, I, I have to say, as, as a journalist of 25 years, that this this notion that Russia has a right to push back feels to me like total propaganda, and that sounds, that strikes me as a completely Russian propaganda um, view of this, trying to defend why they've got lots of troops there, which actually look extremely threatening to Ukraine's sovereignty, and given what's happened in the Crimea, um, look extremely worrying if you're a Ukrainian or indeed if you're in the West. Patrick. I need to declare an interest on this one. Oh, do you? Oh, oh yes, it is. Where are we going? Um, I know this area very well. Uh, I've spent a lot of time there. Um, I've met Mr. Putin. Uh, and therefore, I like to think that I've got a little bit more of insight. I was on, on the telephone or the, the Zoom this morning to Sevastopol talking about this very point. Um, it's complicated. It's much more complicated than we can answer easily, I think. But what I would say is this, that whenever I, I go there, I say to, to Russians, ex-Ukrainians, call them, call them what you like, um, how many of you lost a grandfather or grandfathers in the Great Patriotic War? Not the Second World War, notice, but the Great Patriotic War. Most of them will put up one hand, sometimes two hands. Both grandfathers gone. We don't understand. If I asked you the same questions, I would probably be the only person here that said that they'd had a father wounded in the Second World War. Not killed, but just wounded, just with respect to him. Um, we don't understand the sacrifices that Russia made in the Second World War that were imposed upon them during the Second World War, and, of course, that they did to themselves. Leave that to one side for a moment. The mentality is completely different. And therefore, if you threaten a Russian particularly if a German threatens a Russian, or even if it's a perceived threat, the Russians react in a very different way. We've not helped ourselves by the little-known fact, or the little-remembered fact, of the putsch that was organised by Germany, the European Union, with American backing in the Ukraine in 2014, which saw off a democratically elected leader. It did. And not helped by reporting from certain. I was in Sevastopol in 2014 when the Russians, inverted commas, invaded. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. What did they do then? Well, the Russian garrison inside Sevastopol stood too. People don't understand that the Ukrainian, as was the Ukrainian city of Sevastopol, contained things like a Russian fleet, tens of thousands of Russian veterans, parts of the Moscow University, etc., etc. Yeah, some troops came in, but very, very few. But they've annexed Crimea. <sighs> yes, they have they've annexed a part of a sovereign nation. Yes, they have. I, I, I absolutely can't defend that, and I'm not going to try and defend that, bearing in mind, of course, that this was part of Russia until the 1950s, as you fully understand, I'm sure you do. But, but just, just try and see it, and I'm not being a Putin apologist on this point, but just try and see it from the other point of view. Just suppose that, I don't know, somebody tried to put nuclear weapons in Cuba. Well, nobody's well, trying to put... Nobody, I mean, well, nobody's trying to put nuclear weapons but they anywhere have done, near. But they have done. So, well, so, in so, what way? Well, what, what the Bay of Pigs? What no, the no, American... No, no, I'm talking about this situation. Sure, sure, sure. sure. But nobody's it's... talking about stationing nuclear weapons in Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine, <laughs> Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons under the guarantee of, that its borders would be respected. Uh, 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 of, of course. But I am simply saying that if you start tinkering with the borders of a country 
people become terribly agitated. But nobody's tinkering. Well, the only the people, Russians the only people they... tinkering with Ukraine are Russia. That when they annexed Crimea, that they, they seem intent on annexing um, other parts of Ukraine as well. If not, going to fully invade it. I, I don't quite understand was, this idea that well, the West is trying to tinker with uh, borders. I, the, well, uh, the, the West undoubtedly, undoubtedly tinkered with the regime in Ukraine in 2014. They did. It's a fact. They imposed a puppet inside the government, albeit until new, until further elections could come along. And under yes. these elections, democratically, President Zelensky was elected by the Ukrainian a people. Absolutely. But that was not what happened in 2014. This is something which deeply, deeply worries and offends the Russians. But, but nobody is talking about anybody threatening Russia. Nobody's no, nobody seriously thinks that NATO is intent on invading Russia in any shape or form. So, Ian, if with the sort of background that I've just talked about, about the sacrifices during the Great Patriotic War, if German troops move into Ukraine and come up to the borders of Russia, how is Russia going to Which they haven't. That? Yes, they have. No, they haven't. In, yeah, tiny numbers, tiny numbers. But nonetheless, there were German troops there after 2014. Advisors, instructors, and all that. Not, not large numbers. It doesn't sit well. It doesn't sit well. Now, from the point of view of Russia... What are you going to do? My, the, 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 people, the media has conveniently forgotten, of course, that we had exact, exact, very, very similar crisis in spring of last year, in April of last year. Slightly more troops involved this time, more troops going into Moldova, down on the western areas, which in some ways is probably more threatening. <laughs> and then we, you know, Britain did such a sensible thing. She put a warship into Russian waters. In no, June. they were international waters. Well... I not mean, the, not that the Russians. Well, no, no that, that makes a difference. I mean, you've just said they were Russian waters. They were not Russian well, waters. Well, the, the Russians. A British ship can go into any international waters it likes. The Russians thought that it was sufficiently dangerous, sufficiently close for them to open fire on HMS Defender. That's yeah. a fact, Ian. Yeah. yeah, and they shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Legally, they were not entitled <laughs> to do it. Well, I mean, you are coming across as a Russian apologist. Well, OK, that's fine. I, 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 you, you label me with what you like. I'm not, I'm not labelling you. I'm saying that's how you're coming across. That's absolutely fine. I'm completely <laughs> content to say this is not what it seems. This is not the way that the West are portraying this. And it's interesting that that crisis back in April of last year sort of came and went. Russians made us look bloody stupid by using inflatable tanks and rocket launchers and all the rest of it to which didn't seem to be detected by nato until the last moment and now because it is politically expedient for many members of the western uh, uh, the western elites to bring this forward with zelensky saying what's all the fuss about please please stop exaggerating this and the ukrainian tourist board putting out information at the moment to the west saying please come and visit ukraine it's a lovely country which it is it sticks in my craw. I mean, the, the fact there's 130,000 troops on the border, that doesn't really play any role in your views. Uh, so they, they pose no threat to Ukraine. They, uh, I don't believe they do pose a threat to Ukraine. Seriously? They, they could pose a threat to Ukraine. But they they do. Even, even when, and I mean, you've served in the military, yeah. Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, said this morning, mm -hmm. he said, you don't erect medical tents unless you intend to use them. Oh, this is no, not no, part no, of no, a training no, no, exercise. I'm sorry, no, I, I, I completely dis disagree with that. If you're going to put tro troops through their motions, then you put them through their motions, and you do erect tents, you do all of this. That, that's, that's a detail. The truth is, the, Russian is that the Russians are demonstrating. They're carrying out a military demonstration on their borders. They would say, we have armed, dangerous Ukrainians sitting mm. on our borders. I, I, I'm sure Hitler said the same about the Sudetenland uh, in 1938. Yeah, of course you can, you can produce all of these arguments. It depends which side of the dispatch box you're sitting. Um, I know you're going to come back, Eleanor, but I'm going to resist the temptation to call you. I'm going to go to Ibrahim next. I mean, here, the pushback should come from Ukraine and its allies rather than Russia. It's Russians who have chosen to mobilise 130,000 of their troops to be stationed right next to the Ukrainian border. Ukraine is a 40 million you know, nation, 40 million, nation of 40 million people who are um, allies of Britain. And it, it's, it's a responsibility to, of us, British people, or United Kingdom, and other NATO countries, in, in fact, to make sure that Ukraine does not feel um, left, out, left out of this, or they're not alone. I mean, we will stand by them, and we should stand by them to support them in any, against any Russian aggression. Russia is expanding its influence. This is not about a military exercise just for the sake of having a military exercise to show its muscle. The world knows Russia has military muscle. The world is aware of Russia, Russia's sort of, uh, you know, monopoly over the gas um, and they can silence Germans purely by holding on to, the, uh, on to a tap. They don't have to mobilize 
130,000 people to do that. I mean, Russia is playing a, a significant role in Middle East nowadays, which is not a bordering. Russia does not have a border with Syria. Doesn't have. Just, just um, I've just got a text here from Daniel. I Ibrahim, you're of Turkish extraction. Kurdish from right. Turkey. Right. Well, let me see if you can answer this one. Daniel says, why has Turkey, a NATO member, been so silent over the Ukraine crisis? President Erdogan could end, its, uh, end it by blockading the entry point to the Black Sea and, in effect, turning it into a big pond, leaving the Russians with nowhere to go. I mean, Turkey is a NATO member, but I, I believe NATO uh, is not happy with Turkey being its member at this stage because under President Erdogan, Turkey's democracy has been diminishing. Uh, Turkey's um, taken significant roles in, in sort of um, uh, military adventures in Syria, in Libya, uh, and all over. Uh, Turkey and Russia seem to be getting on well uh, because Russia doesn't care about human rights or democracy in any country, unlike Britain or other uh, NATO countries. So, therefore, uh, you know, the, the, the relationship they have built in Syria. Uh, is is making a big difference with, uh, between Turkey and its NATO obligations uh, and its relationship with, with uh, Russia. Turkey has bought S-400 weaponry from Russia, so uh, it's under a lot of criticism. Many countries in NATO are beginning to question Turkey's membership. So NATO is a defensive ally. NATO wants to make sure that its, um, its, you know, its member countries are democracies. They do not become authoritarian regimes or dictatorship in, in some cases. So Turkey is going through a, a very difficult okay. phase here. Uh, their, their relationship with Russia is purely because, as I said, Putin doesn't care uh, what, what sort of human rights abuses are, are taking place in Turkey, what sort of um, jihadist forces Turkey is backing in Syria. It's, it's not its, it's, it's okay. concern. Norman. Let's start from uh, Vladimir Putin, who I think is a, a pretty clever politician, whether you like him or not. And I think his objectives are, are uh, multifarious. First of all, I think he wants to... Uh, make NATO look divided, which I think he is doing because you're getting different responses from different countries within NATO that suits him geopolitically very well indeed. Uh, secondly, I think he's uh, driven by domestic politics and I think when you're in difficulty domestically, I think he is, then having some uh, foreign affairs to distract you uh, may be quite useful. By the way, I think the same thing applies to some degree to Joe Biden and uh, Boris Johnson. Um, thirdly, I think there is a genuine, he's genuinely smarting on behalf of his country for the way in, uh, that's, the way Russia's been handled by the West as he sees it since 1990 because when the Soviet Union collapsed the West wasn't particularly gracious it was rather unpleasant and he now sees um, all those countries that were a buffer zone for Russia um, and the comfort that came from a buffer zone on flat land which can be invaded very quickly as it was by Napoleon and Germany uh, and Hitler later on he sees that now full of NATO troops. And if you look at the map and all the countries have gone over to NATO, he sees that as some sort of threat and also a, a sort of insult to him, I think. So, part, and it's also complicated. I think he's also playing a game where he wants to gain some gain some advantage from the West without doing anything. He's perfectly happy to have troops on the border and gain things. For example, Joe Biden has said, you must, uh, you must, you must cancel this to the West Germany, to Germany. You must cancel this gas pipeline. Well, uh, and if uh, uh, and if you invade, we'll cancel the pipeline. But that means, by definition, if you don't invade, you won't cancel the pipeline. So the pipeline will go ahead, although it was subject to some dispute beforehand. So he will have gained the pipeline by not invading. So I think he's playing the game quite well. He's sitting back there. He's making everybody guess. It's slightly demeaning, in my view, for all these Western politicians to troop over to the Kremlin every couple of days. He's just sitting there listening to all these politicians from the West, making no impact, in my view, on him whatsoever. So he's sitting. Well, I'm surprised he can hear them. They're so far away at the other end well, of the table. <laughs> that's also true. Ian. But I mean, I just think. He's, he's playing it very cleverly, whether you like it or not, and, and that's the truth of the matter. Okay, Eleanor. No, I, I was just quite shocked by some of the things that Patrick said, which I didn't really feel re reflected the situation, but I think we've, we've okay. gone there enough. Right, uh, we'll come back to more of your calls in a moment, and we will hear more about the British Kebab Awards. It's 8.46. This is LBC.
Britain's Conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. Philip in Buckingham says, please can we have Patrick Mercer and Norman Baker back in the Commons? Independent thinkers who don't patronise the voters. Ibrahim also sounds like he will make a great MP one day yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure Eleanor would if she wanted to stand <laughs> uh, as, as well. Um, Ibrahim, British Kebab Awards. Um, they It seems to be one of the big social occasions in Westminster. I've never been invited, I have to say, but then again, I've never had a kebab. Um, why has it become such a fixture in the Westminster calendar? I mean, first of all, you did have a kebab, but um, I'll remind you, kebab is not uh, the donor kebab that you're imagining or you're, you know, the perception around kebab industry is that it's all about late the night. Thing that you uh, slice kebab, off, yeah. Um, I've, so never gyros of the, and, I've never you know, had one of those. Rolling in. But it's not. A kebab, a kebab literally means anything that is cooked over an open and flame. Right. So you could have a vegan kebab where you cook I vegetables. You could have a vegetarian kebab. kebab. You could have fish kebabs. You could have, you could have meat kebabs. Whatever you want. My favorite, like Ellen Hurst, is lamb shish kebab. So any 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 meal could be considered as a kebab. It's the way of cooking. It's a cooking method rather than the uh, perception of so a dish. If I, so if I have the bits of chicken on a skewer, could, that's, your that's your kebab. A kebab. That's so your I kebab. have had one. That's a shish kebab. kebab. Excellent. So you've been criticised on social media already know, tonight so by saying that you didn't have a kebab. So you didn't have a kebab. But this event, I mean, it's it's massive. Isn't it? It, it's it's grown so much. Um, you know, it started about ten years ago. We're having the tenth one on the first of March. So we initially I started this to give a voice to small businesses and businesses which are mainly run by refugees or migrant communities. These are your lo local small takeaways on high streets or sit down well, well established big restaurants across the country. There are over twenty thousand of them, and they didn't have a voice. Um, it was mainly run by Kurdish communities from Turkey. Uh, it's very similar to Indian restaurants being run by Bangladeshis mainly. So it was the same sort of um, mm -hmm. issue going on. So we, we thought, I thought you know, it's important to find a way to put this on the agenda, get people in, in, interested. And we did manage to get a lot of media and uh, politicians uh, interest. Uh, so it's now become a, a fixture a within Westminster's calendar of events. Well, I suppose when you think about it, there's a lot of votes to be had, though, isn't there? <laughs> it's a huge community. So yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm sure we could spend the rest of the programme talking about kebabs, but we're better not. Um, let's go to Harry in Moreton Forest. Hello, Harry. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Hi. Good evening, Good evening, defence lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Straight between the shoulder uh, blades. Go on, Harry. Uh, what does the panel think of the news item that it takes twice as much copper input to build an electric car than a petrol car? Does, why does that matter? Well, I saw the item in a computer magazine uh, about the copper theft suffered by BT where they're having their cables ripped out the roads. Okay, does anyone here own an electric car apart uh, from me? I do. And do you like it? I love it. I hate mine. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> what kind of, have you got something posh like a Tesla? I've got an Audi. Oh, um, I've, got, I've got a Nissan Leaf. I'm, I'm down with the people and I right. love my Leaf. So what about this question about copper input? I mean, they're, they're, it, electric cars are not necessarily as environmentally friendly as we're told, are they? The creation of electric cars because of the um, the uh, elements in the batteries, the kind of cobalt and things, comes from some of the you know most terrible places on Earth. So that's the the minerals coming from the Congo and those kind of places, and there's a big shortage of them, um, and that is definitely problematic. But they do use, particularly if you run your car on um, green energy, and most of the places where you charge up are from green energy. You don't. You're not using um car you, you're not you're not burning carbon when you drive around in your car and it's also much much quieter um it's really it's a very pleasurable driving experience and um, the acceleration talk, is fantastic the talk is incredible the acceleration is fast. three point one yeah not to 60 point yeah, nine seconds it really is fast. i can't actually put my foot on the floor because it frightens me yeah no it really goes fast when you when you take off from a traffic light you could absolutely burn up any kind of porsche drive or something like Patrick. that which is fun i have very very little to add about that i haven't got an electric car yet i'm sure in the fullness of time i will do and i have absolutely no doubt that we'll be able to get plenty of copper coming in from Ukraine. I'm sure we will. <laughs> Can I just sound electric cars that the real problem with them is that there aren't enough charging points, mm. particularly out of London. And Don't now that it. more and more people are getting them, when you turn up at a service station, it's a complete nightmare. There'll be yeah. like 50 petrol um, places where you could fill up and there'll be two charging points and one of them is always broken. Yep. And uh, Ecotricity, who run them, are a, a disgrace. 
Well, they run some of them. There's lots of, that's the other problem. There are lots of different companies. Oh, yeah, that so run you have them. a million apps so you ha- on you, your phone. You have to register with all the apps. Anyway, don't get me started, Norman. <laughs> I presume the question is uh, implicitly saying that there are downsides with electric cars, which aren't there with petrol cars, which I'm sure is true because it's a, it's a balance. And there was a while, ba- a while back, there was a major problem with copper theft on the railway mm. uh, when people were stealing that and causing trains to break down because it's, it stopped the signalling from working. Uh, and somehow Network Rose got round out. So maybe there's a way around the copper in the cars. I have to say, I don't, I don't have an electric car, although I tend to think I'm quite green normally. I don't have one because I don't like automatics for one reason. Mm. Um, I've only driven an automatic twice and both times I've hit a wall. So <laughs> um, I have another one. I, I'm relying on my 1971 Triumph Hero Convertible. That's what I drive. Oh, they are fantastic. <laughs> I've always wanted one of those. Ibrahim. And I don't own an electrical, electrical vehicle yet, but I will be, like many others, having one soon. Um, I mean, this explains having twice as much copper input into an electric vehicle explains why they're more expensive than other available cars, petrol cars or diesel cars. At some point, I mean, this is about mining. This may cause more environmental damage, you know, to extract copper uh, and other materials used in the electric vehicles for the timing. But long term wise, it's important and it's good for the environment. And I think many of us will be either voluntarily or um, will be asked to uh, own an electrical car and will be Will no longer use the right. Well, I mean, I, my, mine will carry on. It's, it's just turned 50. It's doing all right. <laughs> Harry, thank you very much for that. Uh, text question from Jake in Finchley. Average house prices rose £27,000 last year. That's more than what I earn. How on earth can young people like me ever hope to get on the housing ladder? Is it time we just gave up and accepted a life of renting? Now, bear in mind we have uh, three and a half minutes to go, so if you could all be a bit brief on this, I'd be grateful. Norman, let's start with you. Um, I think it's, it's absolutely a fair point to make and it's desperately sad and and I think we need to see more public council housing uh, for rent and if we had that and we had genuinely properties to buy which were cheap which we don't have because so-called affordable houses aren't affordable we go along with to solve the problem. Ibrahim? I mean uh, house prices are on rise, rents are on rise we were all expecting as a result of Brexit house prices to go down rents to go down unfortunately this has not were happened. We? we were I were mean we? the, the conversation e- on the streets. E- even I didn't say that would be a benefit <laughs> of Brexit. Have, but the conversation on the street, <laughs> among, uh, but the conversation among the street, among many people, was that once the Brexit happens, the, the cost of living will go down. Well, rents will go down, yeah. house prices will go down. This did not happen. I mean, the cost of living is on rise because of everything. I mean, COVID, uh, you know, Brexit itself. So I think it's a worrying time for many young people who are beginning to feel that they will never be able to get onto the okay. housing ladder. Eleanor. I think it's really difficult for young people. I've got um, teenage daughters. I don't know how they'll ever get on the housing ladder. Probably their parents or their grandparents who've benefited from, from the big rise in house, house prices. They just sort of like you to die, to... basically, don't they? Yeah, basically. But no, I, I think it's Pretty terrible. Cheerful. I think it's a real, it's a really massive problem. Patrick? I think my son was saying something about my dying the other day <laughs> with, with a certain amount of uh, anticipation in his voice. Look, I, coming from me, this is hardly right, but I, w- the government's got to help on this one. Mm. Uh, we have a society, unlike certain European societies which believe much, much more in renting where there is no stigma from that Mm. point of view, if that's the right phrase to use. We don't, and I don't see us changing our attitudes in the near future. There's got to be government help for young people. Right. um, Our fun question for the end, it's from Sean in concert. Um, Sean has called, but we haven't got time to get him on air, so I'm going to read out his question. We're getting battered by the wind up here. from concert in the northeast. What would you call the storm? Now I don't know whether he's read my piece in the Telegraph today, where I said it is ridiculous that we call these storms Storm Dudley and Storm <laughs> Eunice. They need to have threatening names, don't they? Um, Norman, what would you call it for the storm? Oh, for goodness, I don't know what I call a storm. What would you call a storm? Uh, no idea. I'm sorry. <laughs> Very weak answer, Patrick. Storm Tempest. Oh, that's a good one, Eleanor. Alex Ferguson. <laughs> hair dryer. Like hair dryer. Storm hair dryer. <laughs> storm Abraham. thunder. Storm what? Storm Thunder. <laughs> I'd call it Storm Tyson. Because it's got to have a bit of threat. Or Storm Cruella, don't you think? Storm Boris. <laughs> no, no, that wouldn't no, work. No, I don't think that'll work. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. Patrick Mercer, Definitely. Eleanor Mills, Ibrahim Douglas and Norman Baker. Thank you very much for joining us on Cross Quest and we'll be back with another edition on Monday. Now, in the next hour, we're going to turn our attention to the subject of mental health, which is something we talk about quite a lot on the programme, but we haven't done for some time. This is because the number of patients being referred for talking therapies by GPs has fallen by a third, despite an explosion in mental health problems since the pandemic. That's according to figures out today. I want to hear your experiences of when you've needed to uh, get either a talking therapy or a 
personal consultation, any sort of help with your mental health. How have you found it? Is it getting better now we seem to be emerging from the pandemic? What suggestions would you make for improving mental health services? 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC.